Welcome to Sherlock Mondays. I am Edward G. Pettit of the Rosenbach Museum and Library in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And we're going on a biblio venture through the stories of Sherlock Holmes. This is episode nine, The Five Orange Pips. And joining me as co host is Mary L. Caro. There we go. Hi. <laughs> Hello, Mary. <laughs> And look who we have joining us, Mary. Our special guest for today is Ray Betzner. Hi, Ray. Hi, guys. This is going to be great having you here, Ray. I, you know, Mary Mary and I, everyone, both know Ray, and and there's nothing more fun than having conversations with Ray. So I'm so oh, happy. Wow, that's very kind of you to say. Well, everyone, uh, what we will be doing is... Uh, and, and Ray is here because once a month, we like to have a special guest to talk about a special Sherlockian topic. And on this episode, Ray Betzner will talk to us about the Baker Street Irregulars organization and Vincent Starrett, too, because how can we not talk about Vincent Starrett with Ray Betzner? Um, and then Mary and I will discuss our story for this episode, The Five Orange Pips, because that's what we do here on Sherlock Mondays. We deduce, decipher, dissect. Arthur Conan Doyle's stories about the world's first consulting detective, Sherlock Holmes, and his able assistant, Dr. John Watson, in a kind of conversational annotation. If you are watching live right now, please like and subscribe and have fun in the live chat. If you're and one of the benefits of watching the show live is you get to do the live chat with these people. It's like two different shows going on at the same time, which I really love. Um, if you are watching the recording, also please like and subscribe. Sherlock Money is, is also an audio podcast. And thank you to all of our podcast listeners. Uh, I would ask everybody to please consider making a donation to the Rosenback. Uh, that's how we get to do these shows. Uh, if you have donated or joined as a member of the Rosenback, thank you. Uh, so much uh, because of your support uh, is is well as is why we exist. Um, so if you have not already donated or become a member, do so so we can exist. Um, thank you uh, very much. Um, like yeah, I went off. I went off script there. I was like, I, I lost. This. <laughs> yeah. It was good. It was good. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> Before we start our discussion tonight, I want to start drinking. So. Um, <laughs> um every episode it. every episode features a sherlock tale designed by our co-host mary l carroll mary what is this delicious drink for this episode and i'm gonna tonight. make it too. oh yeah tonight i made it it's in the wrong glassware but you know i'm I'm away from my home bar um this is the lone star martini which is a uh a twist on the espresso martini i have and instead of the five orange pips we have yes. uh, um, espresso beans, and I yes, will five so, beans. I have five <laughs> espresso. Well, they're really coffee beans. They're not yeah. espresso. So um, five coffee beans, and it's you know it's um, one and a half ounces of vodka, two ounces of coffee, or you know you can use cold brew. You can use if you want good foam, you should use um, fresh pulled espresso shots. But I used um, you know my coffee from this morning, and it it foamed up pretty nicely in the shaker. Um, half ounce of a Grand Marnier or, or Contru or um, any sort of orange liqueur you have lying around. And then um, dealer's choice in terms of um, the liqueur you want to put in there. Um, I have um, the coffee flavored Sambuca. So it's just a little extra coffee on coffee. I um, have Kahlua. And Kahlua Grand is a good, that's how I originally envisioned this. And I, 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 and I just spell vodka weird. I spell a G Y N. So that's what I, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I have never put I'm a gin girl through and through, but I have never put gin in an espresso martini. So you'll have to let me know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll see. Um, <laughs> I told you what I did instead of, well, I'm going to make it this way and then I'll see if I need to add coffee. Yeah. Cause what I did is I made coffee ice cubes. I poured coffee into the ice cube trays oh. and, um, uh, and told my wife so she wasn't shocked. Like, what's the matter with the ice? No, don't worry. It's it's actual coffee. And I'm going to shake it with that and then keep them in there and see how that works. And it might yeah. need actual coffee too. I don't know. Um, but I thought I would do it all at once. And then... So while, while you're doing that, um, so I'm, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Baker Street Irregulars. They didn't have those fancy pants martinis back in the 1930s. 
when the BSI uh, was was in its primal stages. Uh, so, you know, for a little while, they were still drinking illegally. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they were, but I'm, I'm having better gin than they would have had if they were drinking it illegally. And uh, just, just a plain straight up martini. I didn't have the right size martini glass. So it's only half, uh, <laughs> so, you know, it, this, this is really kind of, kind of all you should have, but this is just straight uh, gin and uh, vermouth and um, it's delicious and you and your fancy pants drinks. Uh, that, is a, that is a proper size martini too. That I is. know the, the glasses now are huge anywhere you get them, and they and they should be half that size at yeah, least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, look okay. at that! Hey, that I used that, to that, pay for this, and it does. It's a much lighter color, and we'll see if I need to add the coffee to it. Okay, all right. That's a big brain move, though, with the um the um coffee ice cubes, because of course then you don't have any dilution. No, it works. Yeah, yeah. That's a trick, anybody, for your iced coffee in the summer. Fill up an ice cube tray with coffee, put it in the freezer. Then when you have your iced coffee, you don't have to dilute it at all. So Sherlock Holmes would approve. We're doing so much good, like chemistry stuff on this show. <laughs> Forgotten the beans were going to float. So, yeah. <laughs> so now I have to make sure I don't like, well, it doesn't matter if I get one of my. Ingest them. Yeah. 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 The floating part them. is fun too, because it's ominous because you remember the pips. Mm, that's good. That's good. And it's use not the overly, mustache as a strainer. That will keep the be beans out, Ed. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, but uh, it's not overly sweet, which is nice. Um, uh, I, it's made, I know the gin doesn't matter when you're adding like Grand Marnier and, and Kahlua and like you're, but, but I have a gin that is not like a very herbal profile anyway. Oh, yeah. Like a dry gin, like a Gordon's probably. Yeah. So, um it's actually that uh plymouth gin which is like the oldest gin in in england um uh and it's and it's super 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 good clean with 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 you know shaking it with ice so um but uh no this works really well and i have another one ready to go i might need a third before we're done tonight all right well what we're, we're uh, if you can find the recipe in the YouTube description for the episode, everyone. And I also send out the recipe via email every week for those who are registered for the show. And you can register at the Sherlock Mondays homepage on Rosenbach.org. Let me introduce, uh, fully introduce our guest. Ray Betzner is a member of the Baker Street Irregulars. He is the Agony Column. Oh, man, I love that. Um, and curates the Studies in Starrett blog. A lifelong Sherlockian, he has contributed to numerous BSI publications, speaks about Holmes and Vincent Starrett whenever he's asked. Ray is most proud of editing the 75th anniversary edition of Vincent Starrett's seminal work, The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes. I don't have that one. I just have this cheap, mysterious press one. So um, they're hard to come by yours. So. Mm -hmm. Um, the, and it also won the Montgomery, uh, the Morley, uh, Morley Montgomery award winner. Uh, well, you were also the Morley Montgomery award winner, the 2022 BSI trust distinguished speaker and the co-founder of the DOG street regulars, a new science society in Williamsburg, Virginia, where you now live. So, uh, you moved somewhere else and immediately found a new scion society, right? <laughs> yeah. Cause Ray was formerly, um, of the, um, Copper Beaches of Philadelphia. He uh, became a session to me. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. 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 I. I. I am still a son of a beach. Uh, <laughs> I'm very proud of it. But uh, if you come to Williamsburg, Virginia, one of the the things that's true about us is there's a historic area in Williamsburg that's owned by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. It's a recreated 18th century village. Its main street is Duke of Gloucester Street, but locals call it Dog Street. D O G Dog Street. <laughs> So we are the dog street irregulars. That's what it is. Thank you. That's funny. Um, Ray, we brought you here today. <laughs> tell us a bit about the Baker Street Irregulars, not the ragtag group of street urchins who go everywhere and hear everything and aid Sherlock. Not those irregulars, but rather the literary society, the ragtag go everywhere and hear <laughs> literary society. <laughs> Uh, dedicated to the study of Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson, Doyle, Victorian world. 
of which you are also a member um and have and and i, I just remind everybody uh, ray's also he's been active in our live chat for all these shows that we've done so it's really nice if you recognize the name maybe that's where 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 you saw his name if you're not familiar with the sherlock world um right let's let's start with the bsi today and then we'll go then we'll get jump into the tardis sorry to mix <laughs> No, it's quite all right. We there 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 are many crossovers uh, in in the regulars. So the BSI today is as you as you described um, a literary society, uh, you know, based on on Sherlock Holmes. Uh, it's also very much a social uh, group. Um, uh, I have a friend who says you 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 come for Sherlock and you stay for the friends, and that's that's very very much true. I've had the good fortune of coming to Baker Street Regulars Dinners now since 1985, and these folks are my family. You know, there's there's the family you're born with and the family you choose, and and these folks are the family uh, that I've chosen and fortunately have chosen me. So the the Baker Street Regulars today is there are 317 invested irregulars, and we'll talk about what invested means in a few minutes. But those are kind of the official members of the Baker Street Irregulars. It's an international organization. We have members from all around the globe. It largely uh, is a uh, U.S.-based, uh, North America-based uh, society. But uh, folks from everywhere uh, come into uh, our meetings. Its main activity is to have a birthday dinner to celebrate Sherlock Holmes every January. Uh, and then there are during that during that dinner there are a series of, of customs and rituals which are observed um, while folks are hang on a second. <laughs> uh, enjoying uh, beverages. So um, the the uh, activities surrounding that weekend have grown immensely. And uh, the the uh, the Baker Street Regulars dinner is an invitation only dinner. Uh, you are and and you know uh, you you are invited to be a member. So uh, you know it's an invitation only society. But all the other activities surrounding that weekend are open for all Sherlockians. Um, and if you go to the Baker Street Regulars website, you can see the whole list of everything that's going on there. And if you uh, want to come to New York in January, why you would want to come to New York in January? But if you want to come to New York in January. It's a great time to meet other people who are as fixated on this individual as you are. Uh, you'll find great companionship, wonderful people, and um, just a, a tremendous time. Uh, you'll maybe even find your family there. So I'll, I'll that's, be there this year, which will be nice. Yay! Oh, that's great. Uh, I'm that's not, great. I am not an invested member of the BSI. I mean, we all have aspirations. Yes. I can aspire yes. to it. Yes. Um but both Mary and you are Ray, and um, uh, what, um, and now I'm not remembering your sobriquet, Mary. And, and so, oh, oh, um, oh, I'm Ivy Douglas. Ivy Douglas, that's right. Of um, the Valley of Fear. Of the Valley of Fear, and Ray is the Agony Com. Now, now, why do right? Why do people have sobriquets, and and how do they, and and how do they come up with them? <laughs> oh, uh, so do you ask? Do you get to choose? No. No, no. In fact, the entire process is very mysterious. Um, how you are invited. So you um, inv invested irregulars can recommend uh, people be invited uh, to to the dinner. Uh, it's my understanding this year that a large number of invested irregulars have come. So the number of people getting invitations who aren't irregulars is rather small. So congratulations, Ed, you're among the select group. Um, but how you uh, come? Well, to I, I haven't been invited to the dinner. I've just oh, okay, all right, for the weekend. okay, yes. good to know. Very good. Yes. So, um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. Give us time. Um, <laughs> it's it's entirely up to the leader of the Baker Street Regulars. Um, whoever is, is you know, that that leader is currently called Wiggins. Whoever is Wiggins uh, gets to make the, the those those decisions, and no one knows until the almost the very end of the dinner when uh, Wiggins will read out the names of um, the in individual and their investiture. So that's a special name that is given to you uh, and it represents some aspect of the Sherlock Holmes stories. Back in the day when I was invested into the Irregulars, I was a newspaper reporter. So to have the agony column, 
which was a prominent section of the newspaper in Victoria, yeah. England, made a lot of sense to Tom Sticks, who, who was the person who uh, invested me into the regulars. Did um uh um and where did you have to go to a dinner first and then, oh, and then yes you were... yes yes I I went to a couple of dinners first and I had no idea that an investor was coming um I was a relatively young person to be invested in the irregulars I was twelve at the time so um that what <laughs> how old were you? you were young but how old were you? <laughs> <laughs> I think you got those numbers. Oh, oh no, wildly, wildly off even that way, Mary. I was in my thirties. Um, it it was um, uh, it, it was a it was a stunning surprise. Uh, you know, I I know uh, Mary. So you know, one of the fun things to do is you, you get together with these people afterward and you share your investiture stories. You know, it's I cannot tell you how many times I've heard someone say, "I heard my name being announced." And I couldn't quite figure out why. And it was only when people started saying, you need to go up there and get that piece of paper yep. uh, that they realized, <laughs> oh, wait, I'm being invested into the Baker Street race. It's, it is a stunning moment. And, I was uh, lovingly shoved. Toward <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a grand moment. So, you know, how did all of this come about? So um, it, it goes back to the 1930s. And uh Remember that Arthur Conan Doyle died in July of 1930. And what that meant was there would be no more official Sherlock Holmes stories. The last Holmes story was published in 1927. But we knew then, or they knew then, uh, I wasn't around quite yet, Mary, uh, that um, there were only going to be 60 Sherlock Holmes stories. Doubleday came along and they wanted to publish uh, all 60 of these stories uh, in, in one volume much like this, this is a later uh, printing of it. Um, and they asked a well-known writer from New York by the name of Christopher Morley to write the introduction. And Morley wrote an introduction known as In Memoriam Sherlock Holmes, where he celebrates Sherlock Holmes, not just as a uh, detective, but as an icon. There you go, as, uh, uh, as an icon. And, and someone who um, uh, had a life that went beyond what was on the page. And, you know, for, for Morley, uh, it went even deeper than that. He uh, and his two brothers, uh, Felix and Frank, uh, were avid readers as boys. They would uh, quiz each other uh, about what they had read and take great pride in kind of who knew the most about what was going on and what was happening as uh, Morley grew up. By the way, those three brothers, all of them got Rhodes scholarships. They are the, only, the, the only three, three brothers. right? Yeah. We're Rhodes scholars. Yeah, it's it's the only time it's ever happened. So these are pretty bright people, um, very talented. Each, each of them had extraordinary careers. The uh, uh, Christopher Morley um, was uh, by this point he was he was in New York. Uh, he was a founding editor of the Saturday Review of Literature, and ruminations about Sherlock Holmes would pop up in his column periodically. Morley was also a very gregarious individual. He loved getting a group of people together, even. Uh, during prohibition going out and and you know uh, having a few uh beverages uh with their with their lunches and uh he would get other especially other writers maybe famous people who would come into town to to uh, see a play or be in a play or, or, or something like that but uh you know it it, it could be quite a cross section but you know these were these were pretty talented people he loved good good talk he loved mm -hmm. witty conversation he loved jokes he loved puns um, he just a, a very uh, friendly, flamboyant kind of fellow, and, um, and loved creating communities, which I which I really like. He loved these little you know communities that he would create. Now he also liked the community to be the people he chose exactly. to be in it, but yes. but he loved yes. to create these little communities. The three hours for lunch club and and that precisely, kind of thing. yeah, precisely. And and out of that, uh, and I'm not going to go into a lot of the details about it, um, but out of that grew the idea for the Baker Street Irregulars. Now, that's one major thread. Um, but other things were happening too. Um, in Especially in England, books started to be published that were about Sherlock Holmes. These weren't new mysteries. These weren't pastiches. These weren't parodies. These were, these were writings about Sherlock Holmes as if Holmes was a real person. This mm -hmm. is T.S. Blake at least. Sherlock Holmes, fact or fiction. 
We say about the, about the Baker Street Irregulars, when it comes to Sherlock Holmes, there is a fine line between fact and fiction, and we're here to erase the line. <laughs> S.C. Roberts, Dr. Watson, this is an outline for what could well have been a much deeper uh, biography of Dr. Watson. In the United States, Vincent Sterrett, the man we've talked about a, a moment ago, published this book in 1933, The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes. In the United States, this was the first book that was written about Sherlock Holmes as if he was a real person and celebrates the character of Sherlock Holmes. Now, Sterrett um, wrote uh, what uh, essays, in, in, in some of these essays were ones that played the game that pretended that Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson were real. And uh, he talked about their lives in Baker Street and what that would have been like and how, the, you know, the, the, how these various stories and, you know, the, the stories that were never written by Dr. Watson and what could they have been like and kind of speculates on those other things. In other essays, he talks about Arthur Conan Doyle, his inspiration for the characters. And then he starts to trace the popular culture evolution of Sherlock Holmes. For example, Ed, in the... Um, Versions of the uh, original stories that you're, you're, the PDFs that you're sending around, mm -hmm. they have Sidney Paget illustrations in them. Well, in the United States, Frederick Dorr Steele was the illustrator yeah. who, who kind of created the image of yeah. what everyone in those countries thought Sherlock Holmes looked like. And then God. there were actors it like was William Col Col was, Dor Dorr Steele was Collier's Magazine. In the exactly. Mess, right. Yeah. That's what that's actors the like William Gillette, who who personified Sherlock Holmes for generations of people. And and, you know, Starrett traced all this and talked about the fact that people wanted Sherlock Holmes to be real. They wanted him to be alive. They wanted him to to still be active in in detecting stories and working for the British government, you know, during the First World War and and raising his bees on Sussex Downs. There was, a, there was a need for it, there was a desire for it. Christopher Morley in New York read Vincent Starrett's book from Chicago, and the two of them instantly recognized they were brothers in Sherlock Holmes, what Morley called kin spirits. And Morley wrote a note to, to Starrett saying, I'm thinking about starting a group called the Baker Street Irregulars. We're gonna have our first dinner in December of 1934. Would you like to come? Starrett said, you betcha. And he, he didn't say you betcha, but close enough. He, <laughs> he showed up at the first Baker Street Irregulars dinner. <clears throat> so we're, we're zeroing in. Next year will be the 90th anniversary of the Baker Street Irregulars. Um, so, you know, Morley is, is delighted. It's a wonderful evening. Um, it's, it's a grand time. People soon start wanting to have regular dinners uh, and they want to bring friends. And Morley starts to feel like this group is getting away from him. And, and uh, it's, it's not the group that he wants anymore. And so there are no dinners for, for some years. And um, a third person enters the story. Because um, you know, Morley's also extraordinarily busy as a professional writer, writing novels, writing all his columns for this, that. He becomes one of the first editors of the Book of the Month Club. I mean, he's busy and trying to organize these dinners is clearly not the top of his list. He also needs to make money. Um, but in comes someone Edgar w. Smith. help him. Right. Edgar W. Smith reads Vincent Sterrett's book. He writes a letter to Sterrett saying, I really loved your book. And oh, by the way, here are four more pages on all the things you got wrong. And I think I <laughs> So that's, that's, by the way, that's a tradition that continues till today. Um, I was going to say, that's how we show affection in this group. You're exactly, wrong. Here's exactly. why. I yeah. loved your paper. Now let me tell you everything that was wrong with it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was prepared for it doing this show to be corrected all the time in the live chat, and, <laughs> which I'm not as frequently as I am by email, which yeah. doesn't bother <laughs> me. Like, I'm totally, I get it. And I'm please correct me. You people will notice sometimes in comments on the YouTube videos, I will put, you know, people have written to me and this is what they've said. So, yeah. So um, Edgar gets, Sterrett gets Edgar in touch with Christopher Morley. Um, and, and essentially the deal they work out is Edgar will do all of the busy work. He'll make all the arrangements. He'll send out the invitations. So he'll do all the hard stuff. Uh, Chris can run the meetings if he wants to. He can continue to be the titular head. Of the uh, of of the group, 
Edgar had the big advantage. You know, he worked for General Motors. He was he was a vice president for GM. He had secretaries. And he could just hand all this stuff off to them and say, here, you know, go ahead and do this. And they would. So uh, that's how the Baker Street Regulars kind of got up and running in a more formalized sense. By the 1940s, uh, there were a number of Sherlock Holmes groups that had grown up in communities all around the country. Um, the Speckled Band of Boston, um, the Six Napoleons in Baltimore, the Sons of the Copper Beaches in Philadelphia, and several others. Um, in Chicago, Starrett has started his own group because he, he couldn't uh, afford or wasn't able to get, to get to New York. So he started the Hounds of the Baskerville Sick. And um, it was the decision of the BSI to start investing members to make sure that you, uh, it was clear who was a member of the Baker Street Irregulars in New York and not these Baker Street Irregular-like groups that were in other cities. Um, you know, Starrett often often called his group the Chicago Irregulars. And so it could be confusing to know kind of who was a really, really a, a Baker Street Irregular. So that's where the idea of investitures came from. Vincent Starrett got the first investiture. It was a study in Scarlet because that is the first Sherlock Holmes story. Uh, originally, there were going to be 60 investitures because there are only 60 Sherlock Holmes stories, but the group kept growing. And, you know, uh, you know today, uh, elements out of those stories, not just the names of the stories, are used to, for investitures. You've also been corrected in the live chat. Um, <laughs> it's funny because it's someone it was someone using the name Kinsprit. Um, ah, 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 says that uh, Kinsprit, Ray, uh, 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 Morley and Vinny were pals before private life. So, yes, I don't know. So if they had a, I don't know if that's Steve Rothman jumping in there or not. But <laughs> the morally expert that we all know. Uh, so they had a what I call a desultory kind of uh, correspondence back and forth. They had written several letters, but I've read them. They're nice, but the, there's none of the enthusiasm. There's none of the joy. There's none of the playfulness that you see in their letters. Um, Morley uh, loved calling people by nicknames. He called Starrett Vincenzo. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's, uh, it, but it, that that came afterward. That came after they recognized they were Sherlock Holmes uh, fans. So uh, absolutely right. Thank you for correcting me. I, by the way, have invited several members of the Big Street Regulars to specifically come in here and correct me correct because you they, they're much smarter than I am. Um, so what does the Baker Street Regulars do? So beyond this dinner, there are activities of the Baker Street Regulars that folks can become involved in. For example, we have a quarterly journal called the Baker Street Journal. Huh? Clever, right? Good. All right. So here is here is uh, an issue. Oh, you had the one with Madeline's well, illustrations. I love that. This one has this one has Madeline Quinones's uh, illustration as a cover. Madeline, if you're on 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 the chat, hi. How are you? Um, they also do, in recent years, uh, a, a fifth uh, issue. It is a Christmas annual. It goes back to a tradition from the 1950s. Um, and this uh, was the Christmas annual for uh, 2020. Um, and it's about Vincent Starrett uh, and his uh, uh, pastiche, uh, The Unique Hamlet. That um, some call the greatest pastiche ever of Sherlock Holmes. Um, I may have called it that, too. Yes, yes. <laughs> Um, the BSI also publishes a number of books. Uh, we have a couple of different series. One of the um, really interesting ones to me is the manuscript series. Um, most of us are never going to own or even hold a copy of one of the Sherlock Holmes stories written by Arthur Conan Doyle. But you can do the next best thing. You can see it in reproduction. Yeah. Uh, and uh, with annotations on it. And then you could read a series of articles that have been written about it. This one, um, I will admit, uh, I had a little something to do with this. I was co-editor with this with a friend of mine by the name of Dave Morrill. Um, and uh, that, that is part of the manuscript series. There is also a professional series. Um, this is uh, Nerva Knowledge. Uh, it was done by uh, Bob Katz and Andy Solberg. Uh, and it has tremendous amount of information in there about what the medical world of the late 1800s and early 1900s was like and how that relates to the Sherlock Holmes stories. Well, you know, there is a way you can actually look at a manuscript and hold it in your hands. And that is yeah. at the, you can set up an appointment oh. at the Rosenbach Museum. We have the empty yeah. house manuscript. 
Uh, Mary, have you seen? Did you see the Doyle when you were there? Or you were you just. No, I actually Chaucer? haven't seen the empty house. Just looking at Chaucer, you know, fourteenth century. No, I was Chaucer there with the. I was there with the, the Canterbury Tales. <laughs> yeah. Um, All that other stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, my, uh, one of our other co-hosts, Monica Schmidt, uh, had had come into town and and to look at our Morley collection or our, our we actually do have a Morley collection, but to look at our Doyle collection and uh, the um, uh, and the empty house manuscript. Um, so people can do that actually. Uh, at least with our manuscript, you can come and see it yourself if you set up an appointment on the Rosenbeck channel. Um, the um, the irregulars developed. Oh, I mean, they kept meeting. But but by this but by this point too it's it's a bunch of men right ah they kept it that way yes. for a criminally long time correct yes, absolutely and um, so the first meeting uh, when Morley sent out his notice he sent out a note to it that said this meeting will be stag and we don't know whether he meant forever or just that one meeting, but it became- And it's interesting because his other little groups that used to meet had women with them, oh, yeah. you know, like all the time, the, the mm -hmm. grill, grill pulser, grill whatever. Parter, right, yeah, yeah. Grill yeah. club did, you know, yeah. is yep. he, didn't, he didn't seem to only want to hang with men, but for this, he said this one was going to be, even though they were going to honor a woman, which became a tradition, right? Yeah, the, yeah, and then and then politely room. escort her out of the room so that yeah. the boys could yeah could have their fun. Yeah, you know, and this went on for a long, long time. It wasn't until 1991 when Tom Sticks uh, decided, you know, this this is foolish. Uh, there yeah. are extraordinary. I mean, there there have been extraordinary women who have been uh, Sherlock Holmes fans uh, all along. Uh, the fact that they were not part of the Baker Street of regulars, to my mind, as you say, is criminal. Uh, and uh, that that should not have been. Uh, you know, I've been part of the Baker Street of regulars when it was all boys. I've been a part of the BSI when it's co-ed. I like it a whole lot better now. And mm -hmm. um, there are still a few friends of mine who uh, tut tut uh, and, you know, grumble under their voices. But I don't care. Uh, you know, uh, it's, <laughs> it, it's a lot of fun. Oh, um, before I forget. The Baker Street Irregulars has, by the way, three official colors, and they show up in things like bow ties. Those right. three colors are purple, blue, and mouse, or gray. Those are the three colors of Sherlock Holmes's dressing gown described in various uh, tales during the course of the uh, 30 years that those stories were written. And so, as you can see, uh, Although the BSI dinner is black tie, one is allowed to uh, <laughs> also uh, wear this this tie uh, because it is the official tie of the Baker Street Irregulars. Well done. Um, so I, I I love how you know I mean you 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 live in the in the Vincent Starrett world like that's the world you really love, but uh, not not to exclude Sherlock, but. But you're really so much a great, you know, Starrett expert and, and love his writings. Um, and it's 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 a good. It's one of the reasons I wanted to have you to do the, the BSI talk is because I know that Starrett's involved with, you know, the the early days. So it's a good way to bring Starrett in too. Um, Starrett is also responsible for one of the greatest, you know, poems. Well, it, it, the greatest poem written about sherlock uh 221b correct right that's right so uh and where was that was that published originally in the baker street journal uh no uh it, it has a long publication history it um it was written during world war ii when frankly it didn't look like very, it didn't look very good that england was going to survive and you know starrett who had walked up and down baker street was appalled by the notion that so much of Europe had fallen and that his beloved England uh, would would meet the same fate. Um, the Blitz destroyed many portions of London and it destroyed the block on Baker Street that uh, Vincent Sterrett and uh, uh, Gray Chandler Briggs, who helped him with the, the private life of Sherlock Holmes, had identified as the block where Sherlock Holmes lived. Uh, the building was was a burned out husk and had to be knocked down after the war because it was dangerous. Um, and so he, he sat down. Uh, Starrett was a, a poet 
uh, all of his life. And um, he wrote uh, 221B um, as, as a poem to the loss that he felt had taken place. But his hope that uh, despite all these terrible losses, um, the spirit of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson uh, and their friendship would continue to, to survive. Um, there are many Sherlock Holmes science societies that read this poem at the end uh, as a kind of benediction before everyone breaks away and goes out on, on their way home. Um, it's a um, it's it's often a part of the BSI dinner. There there are other pieces of the Baker Street Irregulars dinner that that are traditional too. There are toasts to a half dozen important uh, members of the uh, Baker Street cast. Uh, we read the Musgrave ritual uh, a, in a call and response fashion. Uh, and uh, if you uh, well, uh, ever get yourself uh, invited three times to a meeting of the Sons of the Copper Beaches, you actually have to do that on your own, uh, which is which, as uh, we can all attest, is not easy, especially if you've been. Um, yeah, but, but you do it with a group of people. So the key is just to be a half beat behind everything. You will be heckled. You, you, will, be heckled. <laughs> you will be heckled. That's right. You will be heckled. Lovingly. Uh, we have, well, the 221B poem, I, I put a link to the poem for everyone in, oh, in thank the you. live chat. But um, I dare I ask that, dare I assume that you do not uh, know this sonnet by heart, right? I, you know, uh, one of the great disappointments of uh, my mentor in the Big Theater Regulars, Chuck Henry, was that I had never memorized this poem. And it's because I can't memorize poetry. Um, I, I, I am terrible with a script. And so I am I would not dare it. Mary, uh, do you have it there? I have it in front of me. I, you know, I actually used to know this by heart. when really? I Really? Read well, it anyway. Just read it for more, everyone. You're more impressive than, than I. I don't know if I ever told you this. I had this poem on my wall when I was 12 and became a Sherlock Holmes. Really? Lawyer. Yeah, I had it oh. come back to my wall. <laughs> oh, how about that? Good for but you. But I do I'm have it. Grab it. Yeah. <laughs> One of those books back there has it. So this is this is a book called Autolycus in Limbo. Um, you you wouldn't think of it as being a Baker Street Irregulars book or a Sherlock Holmes book, but this was the first book publication of, of 221B. Um, and... Um, Starrett dedicated the poem to um, to Edgar W. Smith. Can I have can all I, together? Can still, I have, hold on. What, what, let's what? have let's have Mary do the first stanza. Oh, and then, very and good. Then, and then you finish it, Ray. I would all right, love sounds that. great. Go. All right. Here dwell together, still two men of note who never lived and so can never die. How very near they seem, yet how remote that age before the world went all awry. But still, the game's afoot for those with ears attuned to catch the distant view halloo. England is England yet for all our fears. Only those things the heart believes are true. A yellow fog swirls past the window pane as night de descends upon this fabled street. A lonely hansom splashes through the rain. The ghostly gas lamps fail at 20 feet. Here, though the world expo explode, these two survive. And it is always 1895. 1895. Thank you. So that's a great ending to that poem. Well done. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, Vincent Starrett as well. Indeed. Yes, indeed. Um, you know, he oh. um, he wrote a lot of other things during the course of his lifetime. He, he wrote mystery novels. He, he wrote detective stories. He wrote eerie and weird stories. He wrote uh, great essays about books, about um authors. He uh, had, uh, he put together one of the greatest Sherlock Holmes collections uh, up to that point and had to sell it all so that he could divorce his first wife to marry his second wife. Um, he, he was, uh, he had, he sold his collections a couple of times because he was constantly buying more books that he could yeah. afford. Uh, and um, it was, it was the story of his life. Um, and, now I'm gonna cut, and now I'm going to cut you off. Oh, good. Um, yeah. Well, <laughs> which well, you told just, me to do. <laughs> very good. Sherlock Holmes was was the was was the passion of his entire life. Yeah. And he, you know, from 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 boyhood all the way through to his very last years, uh, it was all about Sherlock Holmes. Yes. So, all righty. Well, 
I I mean, I and clearly we could clearly there could be a star at Monday show. So uh, that, uh, that you would have you, know you, would, you, get. <laughs> you would have to host. So uh, yeah, there yeah. you go. Um Ray, thank you so much uh, for being one of our special guests here on the show, uh, and I'm I'm also so happy that that you're in the chat every week and watching these shows and enjoying them. So thank you for that. Well, thank you, Ed, for the honor of of being here. I, I I told you earlier, and I'll say it publicly: your enthusiasm for the topic clearly comes through, and it really makes uh, watching these things a joy. Um, you've got some really great co-hosts and you've got yeah. Mary too. So and that me, is, yeah, that's it's true. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really great. Um, uh, I've really enjoyed it a great deal. Thank you all. And uh, I look Thank forward you, Ray. to, to, to the discussion. All righty. Yes, we're going to talk about five orange pips. Bye-bye, Ray. All right, Mary. Oh, that's I mean, I just want to I just want to talk about Vincent Starr yeah. and all this kind of stuff with Ray because he's got all these, you know, you know, it, 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 he's so knowledgeable about so many different yes. things about about Sherlockian world and all this, and and it's so much fun. Um, One of my favorite things to do at a Sherlockian event is give Ray a few beverages and just yeah, let him go, just ask go. Him questions. Yeah. And... But we oh, are going, oh, and he's oh, jumping he's right back. back on. Oh no, oh. he's back. There you go. You jump back on, Ray. There we go. Now he's <laughs> on again. So he, was, he wanted he was to make sure we were saying yeah. he's got to find the link now to the YouTube to watch it live. Um, we we well, but we need to do a story tonight. So thank you everyone for waiting for the story. Um, and we'll try to get the story done in in about uh, ninety. In about uh, actually, we'll, we'll try to do it in an hour and fifteen, which would be perfect timing. Um, we have shared a PDF of a facsimile of the five orange pips as it was originally published in the November eighteen ninety one issue of the Strand Magazine. You can download that on the Rosenbach's Sherlock Mondays page, and we are going to start talking about it, Mary and. Before we even get to the story, and you didn't know this because I I was doing this today, um, because uh -oh. it just it just never ends the kind of rabbit holes you go down. <laughs> oh, it's true. I keep mentioning to people that these stories, like every time a reader of the day opens up the story, it is Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, and then it's Adventure, and this is Adventure Five: The Five Orange Pips, and um. I'm, I don't know why I have been so like on that, but I realized what it was just uh, a couple nights ago because so inspired by Watson, <laughs> I he's he's in this story. He says, oh, I'm reading a Clark Russell C stories. And I'm like, I should do that. And I actually had a couple in a couple. I thought I have a little C story section in my library. Um, and yeah. uh I don't have any Clark Russell books solo, but he is in a couple uh, of books. And and so I, I read one of them. It's fabulous. No, but that's not the connection. The connection is the story was actually called The Adventure of a Chief Mate. And, and it's about the, a, 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 a mate, a, a sailor on a ship. He falls overboard and there's the volcano exploding. And, you know, it's 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 totally fascinating extraordinary well-written story what doyle says about russell in the story is true he's a beautiful beautiful writer but it leads me to think like sherlock Holmes stories are called adventures now for the time first of all adventure stories novels they were becoming a distinct kind of genre almost in the late 19th century that that's that's developing uh, an adventure story tends to have uh, charismatic heroes, terrible adversaries, uh, and plotting that emphasizes action over character development. Now that I'm looking at that, I must have pulled that from somewhere. I'm sorry, I can't give you the reference. I pulled that description from somewhere, probably the OED, but I'm not sure. Um, we, But we now, present day readers... We don't usually refer to mystery detective stories as adventure stories, you know, like that's not only its own genre and adventure story, but but more importantly, when you see adventure, I think you have different expectations than you would have going into a mystery detective story when you see something is an adventure. Um yeah. 
But for late Victorian audiences, and this is, I think, must be why I kept bringing it up, I don't think the reader made those distinctions. Um, Doyle, in their minds, Doyle Sherlock Holmes stories were in the same category as something like H. Ryder Haggard's King Solomon's Mines or Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, maybe even Jack on Hyde, you know? And I'm even, I, I started to look up critical literature from written now by scholars on adventure stories and that genre and how it develops in in that context most of the studies even just talk about doyle's lost world um mm. other works of his not the stories as being adventure stories because that's how we define them right and, and i find that fascinating that you know that his original readers just saw it like now the sign of four is an adventure story anyway there's like a big chase it's like there's action um but for the short stories these are mr detective stories for us not adventure yes but... although i think you and i have talked about this before and that this is we're still very early in the birth of detective fiction as a genre um and so there are no real hard and fast rules yeah. i think surrounding it um i don't think there's a concept yet really of detective fiction as a genre at this point so much as an adventure that features a detective yeah um, and of course holmes being an unofficial consulting detective um as opposed to a, a, a police inspector um mm -hmm. i think further um gives us an, a, another layer of, of adventure because he's of course not beholden as we see um necessarily to the law sherlock holmes can do things the law cannot do um he can go places where the law can't go um and the problems that he's called on to solve are sometimes not um problems that have um legal ramifications so much as perhaps social ones we saw this with a case of identity um yeah so and, and and there's and it becomes like this is the most the sherlock holmes stories are the most influential stories for developing the mystery detective genre um i mean it affects all of you know all the mystery stories crime stories after it even if they're mm -hmm. even if they do something different they kind of harken back to this knowing full well and you know me the you know all, all about Edgar Allan Poe that yes. Poe kind of invents this formula yes. but it's really it's it's because of Holmes that it becomes this genre in and of itself um yeah. uh but the adventure and and it, it, there's all kinds of crossovers with the adventure elements I mean some stories there will be you know Holmes you know kind of you know battling people for real and um and that kind of that whole charismatic hero part of it and that's that's all there um but uh, just a reminder for me as i'm reading these that the first readers were perhaps thinking of these as adventures and more as fantastical adventures more than mystery stories well and if you come to this story with an expectation of it being a mystery story a detective story in like the traditional sense where a crime will have taken place and the detective has to go out and fix it and solve a puzzle, um, you're gonna be, if not disappointed, then at the very least confused. Um, this is a cool adventure story. This is much less, I think, a mystery story. This is definitely one yeah. of those examples where adventure really suits this case um, over something like the mystery of. Watson will tell us what kind of Sherlock adventure yeah. it is <laughs> because um, the, the opening two paragraphs of this um, uh, story, uh, when I glance over my notes and records of the Sherlock Holmes cases between the years 82 and 90, I am faced by so many which present strange and interesting features that it is no easy matter to know which to choose and which to leave. Um, we get the whole now. Now, here's where we get this chronology, thing, like the dating of <laughs> inviting, <Bro>. inviting. <laughs> future Sherlockian chronologists to say like, wait a minute. So 82 to 90, and we've only had these stories. What other stories are in there yep. that we can, you know, figure out should have been dated sooner that Watson's been holding back and then published later. This is all about creating that universe. Oh yeah. This is where uh, Sherlockian chronology salivation starts and all of our, our desire to find these cases that Watson so happily throws at us that we will never ever see. I actually have a note from 
um, one of my last readings um, from the second paragraph um, where I write, we never see these, some of these cases that Watson, that Watson yes. alludes to. Yes. But, but it's also this kind of, you know, it, it's like these, these are like these adventures here. These are historical documents. Yeah. Like I'm Watson and I'm chronicling, you know, I'm, I'm, these are chronicles rather yeah. than just magazine short stories or, or romances as Holmes would have called them right. um, in, in every, you know, you know, kind of you pejoratively. Know, pejorative <laughs> word that he could add to romance um, that, that, but that's how they're presented by Watson. Now, yeah. Then you have the allusion to stories. He says, some, however, have already gained publicity through the papers. These are the ones that have been published. Study, sign, um, scandal, what mm -hmm. would it be? Redheaded League, mm -hmm. Case of Identity, Identity. and Bosco Valley. Valley. So they're mm -hmm. the ones. Some have already gained publicity through the papers. They're the ones I published. And then he says, others have not offered a field for those peculiar qualities which my friend possessed in so high a degree and which it is the object of these papers to illustrate. Now, what I find interesting there is that Doyle lets Watson state the, like the, the, like no author ever says the object of my story is right. to, um, and that's what he's telling us. And which, which is to basically publicize Sherlock's abilities this guy has this great abilities and I'm, that's the object of my stories is to show yeah, you that. Let me tell you how cool my friend is and all the cool stuff he's done. Then it's some two, I mean the cases, some yep. two have baffled his analytical skill and would be as narratives beginnings without an ending. Sherlock Holmes has been baffled. I love that little hint yeah. that like, he, sometimes he couldn't even figure it out. I mean, that's yeah. just, that's real, but not for Sherlock. Oh. The writing of this story is phenomenal because yeah. I think of how many moments of foreshadowing there are for the outcome of this case. Um, I think this is the first. There are some, right? There are some that baffled his yeah. skill and they would be beginnings without endings. Some were, others would have been partially cleared up and have their explanations founded rather upon conjecture and surmise than that absolute logical proof that was so dear to him, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is the first of the insinuation that he might not get it right all the time. Yeah. And that first crack in the foundation is here. Yeah. Too. Sometimes he's baffled. Sometimes it's these, like you just read there, that the cases are not like definitively solved. Like- yeah. He's yeah. kind of come up with a solution, but it, but it's impossible yeah. for us to know. Yes, and that's yeah. and that's what he says here that you know that that one of these last which was so remarkable in, in its details and so startling in its results that I am tempted to I need that like announcer voice for that so startling it. in its results that I am tempted to give some account of it in spite of the fact that there are points in connection with it which have never been and probably never will be entirely cleared up. You know that. Yeah. That this, and that's what we're going to get. I mean, I love yeah, the setup. I love him. I love Doyle setting the bar. Yeah. I'm going to give you a story that's going to be wow. And whether or not that wows, I think modern readers as, as it does, you know, his readers at the time, I think might be, a, uh, you know, there might be a difference. But. I think there is a difference, but I think it's also, it's wow in a different way. Um, and yeah. we got this, I wish I could remember whose comment this was in the Facebook group that we have for Mondays, uh, Sherlock Mondays. Um, there's a different wow coming in this story. If you have had like full cultural saturation of Sherlock Holmes as like this towering, brilliant figure. Um, this is one of the cases where he's like kind of fallible or kind of, yep. you know, imperfect. And I think that is a different kind of wow yeah. where he's already been established as the guy who can do anything and we come to this case and it's odd um and somebody pointed that out in the in the sherlock mondays group yes said. um and that's that's what we're going to get here um yeah. he then says it's it's uh 1897 and there were lots of cases and then he lists them all you know like and we get that hint that everything has been recorded but yeah. He hasn't written them up as, you know, story. And then he teases them out. The Paradol Chamber, the Amateur Mendicant Society, the British Bark Sophie Anderson, the Singular Adventures of the Grace Patterson's, the Island of Uffa, and the Camberwell Poisoning Case. And and 
what's wonderful for modern readers is that you can go read these adventures written by other people. The Parallel Chamber, the Parallel Chamber was a Rathbone Bruce radio show, um, you know, from like the 40s or, or I think the 1940s or maybe Probably the 50s. Right. Um, yeah. But there were at least 10 stories written, including a, a one by John Dixon Carr. The Amateur Mendicant Society, there's a Rathbone Bruce radio, at least eight other stories. The Sophie Anderson, at least five. Grace Patterson's four. Uh, the Camberwell Poisoning, there's a Rathbell Bruce, uh, Rathbone Bruce radio program, and seven more written. So, like, now we can go back and read some people's takes on these, which is really wonderful to have. That's fun. I didn't realize there were that many iterations of pastiche of these cases. That's brilliant that you track these down. The um, Yes. And then it's interesting that even in one of these, he's talking about that we get the kind of We'll we'll get the we'll get the Doctor Bell you know trick that Holmes does, but we actually like Watson hints at a Doctor Bell trick in one of the cases that kind of you know Holmes observation that leads to things, and that in the Camberwell poisoning case, Sherlock Holmes was able by winding up the dead man's watch to prove yeah. that it had been wound up two hours ago, and therefore the deceased had gone to bed within that time. A deduction which you know solves the case. Um, I love that little you know thing that Doyle does there to kind of. Because, because you know, there's new readers every you know week, and yeah. he, and he wants to keep wowing them over Sherlock's powers. And now it's even like Watson's like, oh yeah, there was like even something I'm not even going to write about that he wowed me about. Um, yeah. Well, the illusion of this like archive that exists <laughs> that he's just sort of can can he can afford to selectively pick and choose what he wants to give us because the there's such a wealth of material that's sitting in the tin box well the story begins it's september and it's windy and we already have the date so like take that chronologist but of course you know as well as i do that a chronol a sherlockian chronologist can be given an exact date and tell and, you exactly why it doesn't say, work no 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 watson's confusing is here he, because he oh, because yeah. he can't reveal certain things yeah so i well, don't there's know a great there's a great little detail in this, like, what, like the third paragraph that makes people who have already, if you've only read four or five Sherlock Holmes cases and you've read The Sign of the Four, you're going to encounter a detail here that is going to make chronologists worry and, yep. and question, right? You know what I'm talking about. Because Doyle is not concerned with yep. any of this. No, like, Doyle's he's like, if he's forgotten something, a name, it, like, it doesn't matter to him. He's just right. he's writing a story. He's written six, and then he's going to write six more for the first right. batch. And this is a paycheck. Not paying any attention. Right. So this, this is a paycheck, but for, but for Sherlockians. And if, for, if you're playing the game, this is your bread and butter, right? You've got this, um, this reference at that bottom of that third paragraph that. Watson says, my wife was on a visit to her mother's. And for a few days, I was a dweller once more in my old quarters at Baker Street. But Mary Morrison is an orphan. So mm -hmm. how can how can Watson's wife, Mary Morrison Watson, be on a visit to her mother's? And this, yes. you know, it's just. And then somebody, someone reading it there might not have that. Someone might be reading an edition where it says an aunt because it was the first book publication that they changed mother to aunt because of course somebody caught it somebody caught it and she doesn't have a mother she's an orphan so right. they've added aunt so yes um uh things like that are wonderful but to back up just a moment i yeah, yeah. this idea too that it's september it's windy the equin well it's not windy the, they are equinoctial gales, Ec equinoctial gales, sorry, had set up with exceptional violence. So, and um, and then Watson says, here in the heart of great handmaid London, we were forced <laughs> to raise our minds for the instant from the routine of life and to recognize the presence of of these great elemental forces which shriek at mankind through the bars of his civilization like untamed beasts in a cage. And it's a, you know, it's a reminder that Holmes and Watson and us, the readers, we live in the civilized world, not the natural one. And it's a reminder that 
mystery and crime fiction is often, not always, but often about kind of correcting that unnatural behavior, that restoring civic civilization, you know, civic order to to the world. And this is a kind of, I don't think Doyle is intentionally trying to make this point here, but that's just what comes out in the text as there is these unnatural, these natural forces are beating in upon them. Um, Sherlock is crossing nexting his crime records, which, which he keeps. And we've, we've found this in other, in another story too, that he has all these records that he's keeping. And Watson is deep in one of Clark Russell's fine mm -hmm. stories, um, which, which is very appropriate for him. And W it's W Clark Russell. He was an author best known for his sea stories. He was uh, like, uh, he was in the Navy and, you know, and then went on to be a popular author. Um, and there's a, there's a Melville connection with uh, Herman Melville connection. I was going to ask you. Mark Russell in that Melville wrote, wrote, Melville wrote, Melville wrote actually only poetry except for Billy Budd, which he never published uh, and never finished. He wrote only poetry for like the last 30 years of his life. People don't realize that like 30 years, Melville only wrote poetry except for, he was working on Billy Budd a little bit. Um, and one of his book of poems that, that he had kind of privately printed 25 copies, this is what he wound up doing towards the end of his life, was called John Marr and Other Sailors. And, and it's dedicated to W. Clark Russell uh, in like a long dedication. Oh, to, it's Melville. It has to yeah. be. And then Russell, in turn, dedicated his book called An Open Tragedy to Melville. Um, and uh, so, you know, I'm sorry. Moby Dick's my favorite novel, for those who know me. So there's, you know, any Melville connection, I'm certainly going to point out. Sorry, that's that's always going to be in the Ed Pettit annotations will be if there's a Melville connection. Yeah, Saint drink every time Ed talks about Melville, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Good, idea. <laughs> Good idea. Well, um, they hear a knock at the door. What? Sherlock says, I do not encourage visitors. <laughs> oh, I love that. Watson's like, oh, maybe it's one of your friends. And Holmes is like, I don't have any. Except uh, you're, for you. Yeah, you're here already. What right? are you All my friends are in this room. <laughs> and it's then, sweet. And then it's, you know, well, maybe... <laughs> Like, maybe it's one of a crony of the landlady. I like, love that. A crony of the landlady. Yeah. What is Mrs. Hudson getting up to? Who she knows? She doesn't have friends. She has cronies. Cronies, yeah. What so, kind of operation she's running from the basement there? Before we get to the guest, I blew right by and I was going to do it when Ray left. Um, I want to remind everyone, I want to take this moment to thank you all for watching or listening, if you're listening to Sherlock Mondays. Uh, the Rosenbach's community reaches all around the globe, brought together by our love for history, rare books, manuscripts, and the arts. Uh, and we have a great audience from all over the world and uh, watching this show. I hope you will consider supporting the Rosenbach and Sherlock Mondays by donation, which you can do at our website or by becoming a member. Membership gives you free museum admission discounts on programs and courses and exclusive invitations to member only events. You can learn more about how to become a member on our website. And remember, Rosenbeck membership also makes a great gift. I used to love that in the in, in the Bibby Adventure shows when we would get notices that somebody's bought a gift of a membership for somebody oh. because they watched the show. And that was really great. Um, I really can't stress how important your support is. So if you haven't made a donation or joined as a member, or if you have and you have the ability to make a further donation, I would be very grateful. We also have, as Mary alluded to, we have a Facebook group page for Sherlock Mondays uh, with lots of chatter on that. It's lots of fun. So it's great. I would, you know, if you, if you use Facebook, it's it's great to go on and do that stuff. And there's also an audio podcast version of this show. Look for the Rosenbach podcast, Sherlock Mondays, wherever you get your podcasts. The audio podcast drop one week after the video ones. You can always write to me at epettit, E-P-E-T-T-I-T, -T -T, at rosenbach.org. I love to hear from our audience. Um, there will be Sherlockian, uh, Sherlock Mondays merchandise. I am working on that. And when Sherlock Mondays comes to a close with the adventure of the empty house, we're going to have a pay-only series 
on the Hound of the Baskervilles. Look for the announcement for how you can register for that as well. All righty, back to our story. Um, it's not one of Mrs. Hudson's cronies. It is not. Um, and it is, uh, and actually, I, I like this little detail. Holmes stretched out his long arm to turn the lamp away from himself and towards the vacant chair upon which a newcomer must sit. Um, that he sets the stage, he takes control of the room yes, before does. someone even comes into it. Um, I like that a lot. That's a that's an interesting little detail about yeah. it. He I needs- was actually going to call attention to the sentence right before it. I don't want to linger too long because no, there's so much to cover. Um, but this is another crack in the foundation, just very subtly. Sherlock Holmes was wrong in his conjecture. There came a step in the passage and a tapping at the door. Again, we've got the Holmes isn't perfect all the time. That's true. Yeah. This conjecture. I mean, it's just very funny for me to go back through this story and again look and see like where the where the chinks in the armor are, where we're being set up to be like, this isn't Superman. He's not infallible. He's not perfect. He doesn't always I'm, win. I gotta look that up in a database of home stories. Where does Watson literally say Sherlock Holmes? was wrong it was wrong i know it's of course in the trivia people would think like oh it's about just like you know he's 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 clearly about our case no it's just a tiny little detail here just in general we just want to know about someone coming in to the place um they um in walks um this man uh young two and twenty um uh who has something about refinement and delicacy about him uh, he's also wearing these golden pince nez glasses, um, which are these kind of uh, arm. They, they don't have the arms that go over the ears, that, but they pinch onto the nose. And um, Teddy Roosevelt, they're famous. I was just like, going to say, yeah, Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt with them. Imagine that one, yeah. Very convenient, just like, because you keep them in your pocket, and you can put them on when you need them. Um, and, uh, but I... Uh, as as Sherlockians will know, they're also used in a later story. There's a story called The Adventure like Ponce, of the Golden yeah. Pin Snez, so or Ponce Ney. Ponce Ney as the... <laughs> um, uh, as as a kid, I was it was like Pin Snez, um, and, and that's what I just said. Um, the um, uh, in which the glasses themselves enable Holmes to make all these deductions to help solve the case, but here it's just. I think it's I, I think it's supposed to signify that kind of refinement, delicacy, yes. fashionableness that, yes, that yes. who this character is. Uh, and that's what his readers would have seen, knowing that they're the kind of glasses that you wore. Um now we get the little trick with the client. Oh, I see you've come from the Southwest, of course, you know, and he has because he's got this clay and chalk mixture on his toe caps. Yeah, um yeah, yeah. Every story is going to have that. What's that? Right. I was going to say, and this gorgeous, like, very, like, made for radio kind of exchange that they have, right? Like, I see that you have the, your toe caps is quite distinctive. I have come for advice. That is easily got. And help. And that is not always so easy. Yes, that is not always so easy. I love that little dialogue. Such a, little, a little, like, radio drama back and forth. Some tight dialogue. I love it. It turns out that there, now we get another unpublished case. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> Major Pendergrast is the you know who has recommended him in the Tankerville Club scandal. Scandal. Um, that um, you know, so in which somebody it's just a card thing, and he had a sort of Sherlock had to prove he wasn't cheating, but but we get that line here, like he's he's like praising Holmes, you know, you are you are never beaten. And Holmes says, I have been beaten four times, three times by men and once by a woman. Now, we know the woman, and that's Ra- that's a Rady Adler mm-hmm. in Scandal of Bohemia. But um, I, I, and, and it's not that we're supposed to know or. No, but, but it's a fun little Easter egg, I think, if you do. It is. And well, one of them, I think, is perhaps John Clay from the redheaded league because home says that oh i've had encounters i haven't been able to catch this guy so i think maybe john clay Ooh, might interesting in here That's um, interesting. but it just depends on how you're going to date this story oh, no, <laughs> creating into the chronology waters the, the chat's going to explode like, <laughs> who could it be and i don't think doyle's trying to hint at us to play the game 
but but it's it's really hard not to play the game. It's yeah, really hard not to wonder mm-hmm. who who could beat Sherlock Holmes. Um and people have. Um they um uh he has tells the story. Um we get this um uh well, first of all. Uh, the the um john openshaw is his name and 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 he gives this kind of you know lead up this is a story that is more mysterious and inexplicable you know than those which have happened you know like this is like he's he's really you know playing it up and oh, yeah. Holmes just a hereditary said, matter too yes and Holmes just says pray give us the essential facts <laughs> From the commencement, and I can afterwards question you as to those details, which seem to me the most important. I mean, this is his method in listening, right? Mm-hmm. Give me the essential facts, and then I'll decide which is really essential. Um, uh, and he does. And his story is, in a nutshell, uh, his name's John Openshaw. His father is Joseph, and he has an uncle, Elias. Mm. Uh, his father... All right, there's a, there's a there's a tiny tiny little rabbit hole. His father has made money in cycle in 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 the bicycle trade. Love it. He was the patentee of the Openshaw unbreakable tire, and you know for for you know 1891 readers, bicycles are still a new thing. Yeah, they had just kind of you know been happening. And Doyle himself though was early on, not surprisingly, an avid cyclist and supporter and really like i mean anything that would get you outdoors and doing activities doyle loved it he was a very you know active athletic person yeah and bicycles I, and I, race cars later yes and but but bicycles i have this uh a picture here of doyle and his uh and his first <laughs> wife louisa on a, on a tandem it's actually not a bike it's a tricycle here Oh there's a God. there's a little wheel in the back and two and she just sits there and he just pedals. That's his job is to pedal his wife around um, because of course she's in full Victorian skirts. She can't be pedaling a bicycle in that outfit. So, or so dangerous. Yeah, so she's just sitting up there up front and he's you know back there to pedal her around and uh, and there's. If you look up Doyle bicycle, Arthur Conan Doyle bicycle online, you'll find all kinds of pictures of him on these, you know, old timey <laughs> bicycles. Because like something straight it. off a Hendrix bottle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He loved it. Um, well, that's that's the father. And that's where they have a fortune. That's where John Openshaw first had money and his father had money. But his uncle, Elias, goes mm. to America. America. And he becomes a planter and a slave owner. This is in in the pre-Civil War. And then he fights for the South in the Civil War. Yeah, fights under Um, Jackson. But returns to America because, basically because he's too racist. Yeah, absolutely. What does it say? His reason? Oh my God, He he had a very considerable fortune in the States. And his reason for leaving them was his aversion to the Negroes and his dislike of the Republican policy in extending the franchise to them. Yeah. So he's a, he's a terrible racist. So he has to leave, he has to leave America for its racism and then go to the British empire. (laughs) Which, which has outlawed slavery already like before. Yes. But which is, which is such a, but, but because it's such a class, you know, society that he can live off on his estate. He'll be protected. And and not have to deal with any of these, you know, people who are darker than him. Yeah. But um, just getting this, uh, we get a little, we get a little baby character sketch uh, of Elias Openshaw here, and not a great guy. Singular man, fierce and quick tempered, very foul mouthed when he was mm-hmm. angry, and of a most retiring disposition. He also drank a great deal of brandy and smoked very heavily. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's not like, so hey. bad. I'm like, wait, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's like, but, hey. he would, but he would see no society. And I'm like, right. okay, well, all right. Well, you not want friends, not I'm, even his own brother. I'm a little more social than he A little is. bit. You you, but, you could be impressed upon to be a little more social with your brandy and smoking. Well, he's an angry man and yeah. he drinks and smokes and he keeps to himself. And, he's and, then, and then when John Openshaw is 12, 
he asks, they like, oh, you should live with your uncle because what better upbringing than an angry, drunk, racist uncle? Yeah, right. <laughs> to go to go live with and yeah. for your, you know, for your kind of education. Um, and uh, he begged my father to let me live with him. And he was very kind to me in his way. Yeah, I always hate that. Oh. Kind of, you know? oh, but he was nice to me. I don't care. Yeah, isn't that care. always the way, right? Well, I never <laughs> had a problem with him. He was always nice to me. Yeah, little yeah. tiny white John Openshaw. Yeah, of course he catch, was. catch a tan, John. See how, yeah. see how nice he is to you. Yeah, um, but he gets along well with his grand, with, with his uncle. And Probably, then... Yeah. And, He's actually in charge of the keys of the house. He helps him with with the with so he doesn't have to deal with you know people and trade people, except the one room, a lump room among the attics, which was always locked. Um. So if you read Victorian fiction, you know this is bad. It's nothing good if there's some. There's a locked attic. It could be anything. There's a locked room in the attic. It could be your first room. wife. It could be anything. <laughs> <you know? laughs> locked attic is bad news well he finally gets a letter one day his uncle and it he and it's from india <clears throat> pondicherry as a matter of fact mm -hmm. and uh and he opens up the envelope and out fall little five little dried orange pips so a seed for people that might seed. not like immediately right. orange seeds. pip so don't drink your pips so um, no, I was going to say we replaced those in this cocktail because I did not feel like fishing slimy <laughs> orange bits out of my out of my cocktail. Yes. Um, they um, and then also uh, it, on, on the envelope. Well, his 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 uncle says KKK. He shrieked. And then my God, my God, my sins have overtaken me. And uh, and. For a modern American audience, right? Well, he was this, you know, racist from yeah. the South fighting yeah. in the army. Of course, he was a member of the KKK because we, yeah, get in the what, year of our Lord 2023, we, we get what we that is. We know very well what those, yeah, we know very well what those letters signify. And so it's a weird mm -hmm. kind of irony coming back to this story, I think. And they're scrawled in red ink upon the inner flap, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the KKK. And then he responds by burning all of his papers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh from a box which also has kkk on the lid like like if i'm encountering a box with kkk on it in like my uncle like i'm leaving like i'm not yeah, dealing with you anymore that would be the worst but yeah not for john o like he doesn't even know what this means he has no no, no he doesn't it's all about right because he asks him he's like what is it uncle and he says death yes it death. means death and then he tells him that then then he then he goes through this process where he's going to leave the estate to John's father. And then, but if John gets it one day, he says, "If you can enjoy it in peace, well and good. If you find you cannot, take my advice, my boy, and leave it to your deadliest enemy." So this estate and all this money, give it to somebody who you hate because that would be better than keeping it. Um, but I'm going to make sure that your father inherits it anyway. <laughs> yeah. So maybe you should have done that. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, he goes on for uh, a little bit, and we'll find out exactly how long, uh, mm -hmm. but he would run around the garden with a revolver in his hand, and then he would hide in the house. Right, because he's not afraid of anybody and then hides in the house like a coward. Yeah, yeah. and then he um, he's finally found dead, uh, drunk, uh, face down in a shallow pond with no sign of any violence, Right. Um, the water's only two feet deep, and he leaves them the estate. His father, John Opachal's father, gets the estate's 14,000 pounds. I mean, it's a lot of money, you know, yeah. uh, along with this estate. So, And there's uh, no signs of violence on the body, and it's ruled as a suicide. Yeah. And uh, Holmes interrupts him because he wants a, a detail, and he's making sure. He says, you know, the um, what's the date of mm -hmm. the of the of the the date of the letter and the date of the suicide Holmes already is like, this is how I figure it out. Mm -hmm. And the, the letter is dated March the 10th, 1883 and his death was seven weeks later on the 2nd of May. So Holmes is you know, already, you know, figuring this out um, is what I, I think the message that the reader gets. Um, 
uh, the 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 brass box comes to their family with the KKK on it, and it's letters, memoranda, receipts, and a register is also written on it. Um, and he says there's other papers that are date that date during the reconstruction of the Southern states, mostly concerned with politics. Um, obviously, his he was really against any kind of you know reconstruction, any any kind of you know the North making lives better for anybody. Um, after the Civil War, um, and uh, and then of course in the beginning of '84, uh, is this like a year later? Yeah, like about a, yeah, about a year later, less than a year later, his father. Oh, well, it's, his father still lives in '84, and then in January '85, so it's a little over two years later, his father gets a letter with five orange pips in it. Again, KKK. But this time the message is put the letters uh, on, put, was it put the papers, papers on the sundial? On sundial. Yeah. Of course. Then, Go ahead. No, what I was going to say, and, and John Oppenshaw, having been with his uncle when his uncle received the letter and seeing how his uncle reacted and how that all turns out, of course, says like, we should go to the police. And his father's like, no, yeah, it's ridiculous. Like, Nobody's going to take we, it seriously. We are in a civilized land here and we can't have tomfoolery of this kind. No tomfoolery here. Because these are the problems of America. These problems come from the outside. These like colonial spaces, right? We get the letter from Pondicherry. We get the, the issues with the KKK in the United yeah. States. This is England. That stuff doesn't happen here. We're going to get to the KKK in a bit and like what people may have known and didn't know that kind of right. thing. But, right. but I, I love this idea. I mean, this is, this is so, this is so cliched for that kind of, you know, British upper crust, yeah. you know, or like, like no tomfoolery and like, we're not concerned with those things, but it's, it, and it's always that attitude also with like colonial possessions and things yes. going on in the world and in their empire. And this is just really, as you said, this is just some American thing. That's not, you know, that doesn't concern us. Yeah. These oh, are things that happen in the colonies. But of course, what Britain always fails to consider in this period is the dissent and the violence that they sow into these places. Yeah. He even emphasizes we are in a civilized land here, you know, like America's not civilized. Well, you know, maybe we're not, maybe we're still not, but um, like, well, yeah, but not because of that. <laughs> <laughs> not because of that. Um, and, uh, but that, that kind of idea that, you know, that's not going to, this, this thing isn't going to affect me anyway. Imagine being a British reader at this period. Like this is your foray to the Americas. If you've never seen them, you've got the Mormons and the KKK. Like yes. that is so the avenging angels and the KKK. I'm never going to America. They're all yes, seriously. <laughs> so there are, there are people who say that now, maybe someone watching from another country already said, yeah, that's what we already like, think now. We already say this about you guys. Like, yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> probably deserve no. it. But he won't uh, let him go to the police. They, this letter is from Dundee, mm -hmm. uh, in Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, and then on. Still not England. Yes. On the. <laughs> on a technicality. But yes. Well, I, I mean, yes. I mean, it could be United Kingdom, but you have to be a reminder for American readers, especially like the the Scots definitely don't think they're part of England even to today. No. I mean, that is you know that's not England. So it's it's but that's where the letter comes from. The comes and from. then um, on the third day after the coming of the letter, his father is uh, found dead. He's visiting a friend, and then he falls into a deep chalk chalk pit uh in As the neighborhood do. um and with a shattered skull of course the the you know inquest finds no ax it was accidental right? so it's what the death was two coincidental deaths after receiving these strange just happens just sometimes happens. people get letters with orange pips in them seeds in them and Random then they letters die. And... So... yeah and then they die it just happens uh, well, now it's two years and eight months have elapsed and he's gotten the letter now, John Openshaw, but the postmark is not a foreign place. The postmark is now London, Eastern London. Division, like he's specific about it, too. The postmark is London, Eastern Division. So come, it's, evil has come home. It has found him. 
the same message, KKK, put the papers on the sundial. And um, and Holmes' reaction, and he's like, well, I don't know what to do. And Holmes, is, I love Holmes' reaction here is <laughs> like, you must act, man, or you are lost. Nothing but energy can save you. There was no time for despair. Holmes is like smacking him, like, yeah, you know. Snap out of it. Snap out of it. This is what you need to act. <laughs> What have you done? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing. Well, no. to do. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's been two days since he got the letter and he hasn't done anything. He hasn't done. Well, he's gone to the well, police. Well, he did. No, I'm sorry. You're right. He went to the police and the police Which were like. Which Holmes is as good as doing nothing, really. <laughs> That's tomfoolery. But, you know, <laughs> um, the police haven't taken it seriously at all. Um, right. Because there's, there's a guard at his door. At his yeah, house. They gave they gave him like, oh, we'll send a policeman off to your house. Yeah. That's fine. So the cops at his house and he's not there. And he so... leaves the house across yeah. London to visit to visit Holmes. Um, and Holmes says it's two days since you had it. We should have acted before. Again, like Holmes recognizes he's already partly figured it out. Like in his head, in his brilliant mind, he's already figured Pondicherry, it was this long, Dundee, it was this long, London, uh oh. Like, yeah. you're like you're lucky it wasn't the next day. So Absolutely. Holmes already r- realizes that there's a pattern here, and that he tells him he should have come sooner. Um, Holmes is doing that thing um, with you know Charlie Day and the "It's Always Sunny" um, photo where he's got the strings all behind him and he's like, <laughs> that's but it's all in his head. Right. Yeah. Well, thing yeah, they do brilliantly awesome. in the uh, in the Cumberbatch Sherlock, in which they kind of like it's text on the screen. Oh, I love it! I like, know. You know, it just shows how he's racing. Things are racing through his head. And okay. um, uh, but that's already happened. But he does say there is one thing. He's got another little detail and he pulls out a piece of discolored blue tinted paper, which was something that didn't get burned when his uncle had burned his papers and he saved it. Mm. Uh, and uh, and on it is this kind of list. It's 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 dates, March 1869. Mm-hmm. And then it's these, like, you know, Hudson came, mm-hmm. same old platform, set the pips on Macaulay, Paramore, and John Swain of St. Augustine. This guy cleared, that guy cleared, visited Paramore all well. So it's like there's, and and and, and specifically mentions, mentions that they set the pips on people. Yeah. And that someone has been cleared. Yes. So Holmes is, Holmes is now completely knows what's going on. So his, yeah. his advice is, well, take that paper write a note saying all the other papers were burned, put it in the box, put it on the sundial and you'll be okay. Holmes knows right. that, that that's the threat. The threat is that he has a paper, he, these papers that people want and he needs to give them back. Um, right. Don't think of revenge. I think yeah. we may have the law on our side, but right now you've got to, you've got to move fast. You've got to work yeah. outside of the law. You've got to work like, the first we'll consideration, remove the danger, and then the second. And then we'll catch up with it. So, you know, let's just do that. Um, yeah. And uh, and he says, you know, you're, he says, I'll see you at Horsham where he lives, which is outside of London. He says, no, your secret lies in London. In London. And it is here that I shall seek it. So. Um, I always uh, see this scene so vividly in my head of him going back from Waterloo because um, when I was in university, I had done a semester at King's, um, King's College on the Strand. Um, and every day I walked over the Waterloo Bridge and I lived very close to Waterloo Station. So in my mind, this scene always of him like trying to get the train back to Waterloo and like making this walk over the bridge is like, I did that walk every day. Um, it's just so crystal clear in my head of the like trying to get to Waterloo. It's uh... Cool. We've had two questions about the KKK. People want to yeah. know, like, really, we're, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that with we'll Sherlock and, and Watson start talking about the KKK. But yeah. um, first, uh, well, he leaves, and then we get this this kind of Holmes sitting and figuring out things that seems to happen in so many stories. And we get a we get a we get a cool pageant illustration of this too, um, which uh, well, it's 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 just another. Holmes contemplative picture that that Paget does. Um, my favorite yep. one will come in the next episode with Man with the Twisted Lip, but um, because this one doesn't have a pipe in it, so I'm like, what? He needs a pipe. <laughs> oh, um, dear. He's such a young man in this one, too. He is very young, you know, right? pensive, staring at the fire. Um, 
you know, dressed in full clothes. Like you know? remarkably put together. Yeah. In this in this sketch, I think. His eyes bent upon the glow of the fire um, as he's trying to figure out, figure out in his head, like put like he's already started that process, as we can see by the details that or the things that he's already warned Openshaw about. But now he's figuring out the rest and he's going to come up with the case. And then, as usually happens, then he will need to test it against then he'll need mm-hmm. to test it. He'll need to you know, like send letters or interview people or find somebody and you know then he tests it out but he's coming up with his uh hypothesis now which is a which is a pretty you know secure hypothesis um they um uh he sat for some time in silence with his head sunk forward his eyes bent upon the red glow of the fire then he lit his pipe see that's why that's like the then he lit his pipe and leaned back in his chair and watched the blue smoke rings people might have noticed i'm smoking a longer church warden pipe today um uh which is nice so which often is out of the screen because it's a long one uh and very big bowl it's one of my old, one of my very oldest pipes so i've had this for a very long time um and uh i think it's from italy is that right am i am i quick right yes it's an italian briar um uh i've had for a very long time so i'm learning so much about pipes on this show, on this series it's very exciting well I'm happy to get you a pipe and smoke it and teach you how to oh, smoke man. it too. So we'll do it in January at the birthday. You know. <laughs> One of my daughters smoked the pipe. Like I got her a pipe for her graduation in high school because they all because the tradition was everybody got a a, a cigar and I got her a, like an actual like a corn cob pipe and we smoked <laughs> it a little bit. It was fun. It's so cute. Yeah. So the last two were like no part to smoke and like, like, One got Dad. a bubble pipe. And you know, like they were not <laughs> interested in anything. Yeah. Um oh, anyway, so they oh, um get a little plug for the sign of the four. <laughs> yeah. Um uh, uh none more fantastic than this, Holmes says about this case. He's like, save perhaps the sign of four. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to buy my novel. <laughs> that is so <laughs> available. Available at booksellers <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Um, well, yeah, save perhaps that, Sherlock. Said. Just a little, just a um, little. We want to know it's out there. Like, if this so, is a pretty cool case, we want to we want to not miss it. Um, we're still, as you said, Ed, we're still bringing in new readers to this world. We are, and and Doyle's not going to miss a chance to mention his previous stories. So, um, uh, Watson asks, "Who is this KKK, and why does he pursue? Why does he pursue this yeah. unhappy family?" Um, and Holmes has this interesting thing that's all about the kind of method here that he uses first. Um, what does he say? The ideal reasoner would, when he has been, when he has once been shown a single fact in all its bearings, deduce from it not only all the chain of events which led up to it, but also all the results which would follow from it. Um, as as Cuvier could correctly describe a whole animal by the contemplation of a single bone. I mean, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's that, I mean, it's that idea that if you know one fact, especially if it's a curious one, as we learn mm-hmm. from other stories, you can kind of, you know, deduce everything that led up to it and that everything that will uh, come after it. Um, the bone analogy is a funny one, considering the how wrong we were about dinosaurs yes it's the people <laughs> that found the first bones they were like oh it must be this and they were yeah they were wrong what did they, recently science has said what well, we have we have woefully under feathered our diagrams of uh, of dinosaurs and our renderings <laughs> but yeah just this um or or you know um the cases of, of um dinosaur bones being put together like being put with skeletons that they don't belong to and and all that we've learned from that. So I just, I, I, I laugh at the, at the bone analogy here because really, can you put together? Because case? Holmes is wrong. That you yeah, actually can't do it's that. It's impossible. So, um, thought that they could, but they exactly, could. Exactly. Exactly. But just, and, just as Holmes can't really like in the way he deduces things in these stories, if we try to do this in real life, like there are a multitude of possibilities that you could go to from yes. this one fact and Holmes all, the, the, the difference with Holmes is he always goes for the right one. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we yeah, would that's right. we would hit one of the others, and he yes, hits definitely the right one always. 
But of course he says, right, the ideal reasoner. So, you know, he's holding out hope that like, if he were the calculating machine that perhaps Watson believes him to be. And he, he, and, and he also says it's not so impossible that a man should possess all knowledge, which is like likely to be useful to him in his work. And this is what I do. Uh, and he says, and then we get a we get a, a a reference to study in Scarlet. If I remember rightly, you on one occasion in the early days of our friendship defined my limits in a very <laughs> precise fashion. And Watson's lot. mean list. Yeah, like his limits. Like he knows this stuff. He knows all this criminology stuff and chemistry as well. But limits, he doesn't know anything about like myths or astronomy. Astronomy, or nil. And, um, <laughs> Philosophy, astronomy, and politics were marked at zero, yeah. I remember. And he's also a self-poisoner by cocaine and tobacco. Yeah. Um, I like how Holmes grins at that last item. <laughs> Is it both cocaine and tobacco you're grinning at or just tobacco? Um, well, but we like, haven't I'm had a, like, I'm hardcore. <laughs> we haven't had a, a, a cocaine you know, reference for a few stories here. No, so we have it's finally, it, but it's we, finally come back. We do get it does get mentioned, yeah. And Holmes basically says, Yeah, well. <laughs> I know lots of stuff, but I put it away in my lumber room in my <laughs> in, in my brain. But when I need it, right, that's when I pull it out. I only keep the stuff that I think yeah. is important. I don't keep the does the earth go around the sun or does does the sun go? I don't care. It doesn't matter. It doesn't yeah. come up un, un, unless I but have a sundial. But now we find out he does know that yeah. he just like he only is going to pull out of there if he needs it. And this is I think I, I love this because it's since that first story, Doyle has just created home as the polymath who knows yeah. everything about everything and is interested. Yeah. Not just doesn't know everything. He's interested in everything. And then that we finally get an explanation of how this is all happening. It's like, this is why you think I know nothing is because mm -hmm. I don't bother with it until I need it. And then I bring it out. Um, He, uh, and then he leads Watson through the clues of the case. Um, mm -hmm. They, he says, uh, well, first he says, give me the American Encyclopedia. Because, of course, you have my American Encyclopedia, not the, know. you know, Encyclopedia Britannica. The, you know, or, no, that is, an, that is an American one, right? Or Wait, is that? I can't remember now. No, I think that must be a British one. Um, yeah, that, that's a British So, But there are so many encyclopedias. But he just has. So there is also one for American because this the kind of diffusion of knowledge since the Enlightenment. Everybody has to come up with these different systems of classifying knowledge and including Holmes, who has his own scrapbook. Yes, including we'll himself. In, which right, he was, other and he was which he was going through his criminal records earlier and kind right. of helping uh, creating that. The um, commonplace book, yeah. But then he goes after he gets the, the thing and, and, and he says uh, the letter K and then he's going to go and then he goes through the he goes through the clues in the case. The letters are all postmarked from seaports. He goes to the time from each letter to the death. Uh, also, how the murderer couldn't have acted alone. So the uh, a single man could not have carried out two deaths in such a way as to deceive a coroner's jury. Like if you're trying to make it look like an accident. Holmes is saying it would be impossible, he says, for one person to kill these two guys to make it. I don't know if that's actually. I mean, I, I kind of think you could actually, because both cases involve like one, you just held him down in the water till he drowned. And the other one, you kind of knocked him off. the. <laughs> yeah, these aren't like really sophisticated murders. Not sophisticated at all. Um, but it is a society. And he says yeah. in this way, you see KKK ceases it's not the Krispy Kreme club <laughs> it is it ceases to be the initials of an individual becomes the badge of a society it's the have you never heard of the Ku Klux Klan the drama of that moment is incredible I never have and the and, and and then and then he goes and he reads this encyclopedic um, from the American encyclopedia entry for it and Which it is it is yes. <laughs> it is true that it it is not. Oh, I'm sorry. It is not improbable that Watson wouldn't have heard of the KKK. Right. I, I I as best I could. You know. I I I looked up things. I was. I I even went through the London Times archives mm -hmm. to see if there were any KKK mentions in this time. There was actually only one. So 
But that doesn't mean there wouldn't have been stories and magazines about it. There were several books published about the KKK, but they were all American publications in the late 19th century. So I don't know how much that goes over, but it is it it wouldn't be it, you wouldn't be surprised if someone hadn't heard of this, especially in England. In right. And especially um, post 1869, right, when the organization is allegedly sort of defunct. Um, we're very yeah. much pre birth of a nation, the film. Yeah. So, I mean, for all intents and purposes, the KKK is this fringe radical group that sort of rose and fell in the American South in the wake of the Civil War. Which is kind of what happened. Like, yeah, Durham gets that right in a sense. Like, as, a, as an official organization, it doesn't stay in power or it doesn't right. stay organized. And it kind of goes away, and then it's not until the 20th century yeah. that it's resurrected it would, again. That it would have stayed dead, but here yeah. we are. But he um, says, that, first he says that in the encyclopedia, it says the name derived from the fanciful resemblance to the sound produced by cocking a rifle. Which, like, what? I, uh, I cannot. Which is not true at all. It's so yeah. weird. It's completely not true. It's, it's, it's so weird. Every, every source will tell you that it's, it's something the, else. The Greek word like kuklos, I think it is, means circle mm. and then clan. Right. You know, so it's this, you know, internal we're we're together. That's that's what that's what it means. Yeah. Um and uh but but I like the idea of associating it with the sound of a rifle, of a rifle. really gives that air of menace. That oh, that... yeah. I mean, in the the whole write-up in the encyclopedia is rather uh, <laughs> biased, um, right? The, it's a terrible secret society. It's known for terrorizing of the Negro, vo Negro voters and the murdering and driving from the country of those who are opposed to its views. You know, like the language in this encyclopedia is very clear. Yes. Very clear how it, it feels about. And yes. how we and you, would, feel. you wouldn't find an encyclopedia written that like that today. <laughs> no. but, Can you imagine? Well, but it's true. And, yeah. and that's, that, that's what, and I love the, but then, then he goes into this whole warning thing that yeah. sometimes they like sent orange pips to somebody and Which... like that, 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 oh. that, that's completely fanciful. It's just made up. <laughs> Sprig of oak leaves in some parts. <laughs> like what? Like oh. <laughs> what they did was they just went and hung you or killed yeah. you or, you know. Burned a cross on your lawn. Yeah. yeah. There was, there's the, the, in historical records, there's a letter that has survived from this time period where somebody was written a letter from the clan and it was mm. basically like, you did this wrong and we're going to get you if you don't get out of here. Like, mm. I mean, so that's not like that, that kind of warning could happen. Yeah. The KKK is not known for their subtlety. Yeah. It's not a terrorist group, but they're not secretive either. No. They kind no. of, you know, I know the hoods and they didn't want to get caught by the real you know, uh, well, what law in their area, there was nobody to catch them. Um, I mean, those kind of things become more ceremonial than secretive in the earlier yes. days. Yes. Um, it does, but it did die out and it, and it wasn't resurrected in the 20th century. So he's kind of, you know, he's kind of got that part of it. He says, and, and here he's tied it into the story because yeah. in 1869, the movement suddenly collapsed. And then he says, you know, that's actually a right around the time that Openshaw leaves America, you know, and comes to England. I'm going to mention one more thing at the end of this encyclopedia entry, just because it touches on one of my favorite themes that we come back to again and again um, in these stories. And it is class dynamics and class politics um, that for some years, the organization, the KKK, flourished in spite of the efforts of the United States government and of the better classes of the community of the South. So already this kind of distancing of like upper class morality and separating it from this sort of more rough and tumble, like riffraff vigilanteism. Yeah. Like this isn't, these aren't like the good old families of the South that are doing this. This is mm -hmm. um, an attempt at some sort of like class stability in the United States that we have here in England. Yeah. But of course that the Americas are wild and they can't rein it in. It's interesting, and I'm gonna have to share this on the on the on the Facebook group. Um, 
the only article I found about the KKK in the London Times mm. was was so racist. It was hard. It was it was and it was so cla- it was it was classist and racist as well. It was about, you know, the kind of uh, about how you know well actually the 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 southerners were really like took care of their you know their of the black people and you know yeah. um and, and but of course there were these awful people who got this name for you know going to violent means but and it was and uh and they mentioned the kkk in it but it doesn't seem to be condemning them as much as the encyc the american encyclopedia <laughs> <laughs> well, this is this is the white man's burden, isn't it? This is yeah. this is the this is empire's um, civilizing mission. Um, which done which, wrong. which Doyle Arthur Conan Doyle is very and especially later in his life, he's yes. very much behind the British Empire and how they control the world. Yeah, but as we're seeing in all these early stories, it's a very you know fraught you know idea for him is empire. Yeah. And what it what it represents, and what it and and what results. I think that's what what results from colonial and uh, you know endeavors is is often problematic. Oh yeah, the imperial project lets loose all kinds of um, demons and ghosts, and yeah. the empire will have to contend with those things, and and will have to of course reap what it has sown in these in these places, including America. Yes. Well, Holmes has the answer to this now. Hand me over my violin and let me try to forget. I won't talk about you playing a violin. And let me try to forget <laughs> for half an hour the miserable weather and the still more miserable ways of our fellow men. And um, it, we forget. I mean, we know that Holmes has Holmes plays the violin and that's part of his image. But mm-hmm. but I think people tend to forget this kind of very, you know, romantic idea he has about, you know, what music represents that is so evident in these early stories that keeps the artist, the bohemian soul that he is art in the blood. Violin music diverts the mind from the misery of humans. And and Holmes is all about that, that that's, that's not a calculating machine, right? Like Holmes has talked about Watson. Oh, emotions. Like, He's very emotional I mean, in certain talk- things. That he he really gets that part of being. He does. Holmes talks a big game about being a brain and the rest of him a mere appendix, but we we do absolutely get glimmers um, throughout the stories of of Holmes' emotional side, and of course, Holmes the artist, Holmes the performer, the musician. These are parts of that, and of course, his reaction to the outcome of this case also tips his hand a bit. All right, let's get to that to the end here. We're gonna get like the next morning, the the, the next day dawns and Holmes uh the sun is shining. Yes, the sun is shining, but Watson opens the paper. You are too Holmes, I cried, you are too late. And apparently Openshaw has died on his way back from Baker Street. <laughs> he died on the way home, uh tossed off a bridge. Waterloo Bridge. <laughs> Waterloo Bridge. Um and uh, but of course it was an axe. It was ruled as he. It was an unfortunate accident. And Watson says Holmes is more depressed and shaken than I than I had ever seen him. But then Holmes says that hurts my pride, Watson. Mm. So is is Holmes depressed because he like he didn't solve it. Um, mm. or is he depressed because poor Openshaw died? Poor Openshaw, um, I know. And I mean, and, and there's a little bit of an admission, right? It's a petty yeah. feeling, no doubt, that it hurts my pride. It becomes a personal matter with me. And I'll set my hand upon this gang. Yeah, I mean, there's a little bit, right? That that I that he should come to me for help and that I should send him to his death. Yeah. He sprang from his chair and paced the room in uncontrollable agitation with a flush upon his sallow cheeks and a nervous clasping and unclasping of his long thin hands. So yeah, yeah. I mean, regardless of how much of this is being beat by a bunch of, you know, racist American thugs, and how much of it is he sent a guy to his death. A uh, death that possibly could have been prevented. Um, who knows? Regardless, the emotion is there. The the telltale signs are on the body, and even Watson can observe and see them and record them for us. <laughs> and it's um, 
he's you know it went and it's it's both i i, I think it's what yeah, it is. i think it is it's both. He's died and it's and it's his own failure and now now he's going to go all dirty harry i shall be my <laughs> I shall be my own police. I shall be my own police. I imagine cracking his knuckles as he yeah. says this. When I have spun the web, they may take the flies, but not before. Um, like Holmes as the like evil spider mastermind. That's yeah. usually an image reserved for, uh, well, that he will use for majority in many stories from now. Right. Um, but that idea that is usually... Uh, See, these these stories fascinate me. I know we don't have a ton of time, but I have to mention this point is that it's the kind of idea that there are there are vigilante stories and there are people operating um, to get criminals in especially especially movies in the last 50 years that have become branded as very conservative, like the Dirty Harry movies like. The system doesn't work. So what's the answer? Go out and kill the criminals and get yeah. something to do it like Dirty Harry or Charles Bronson in the Death Wish movies and those kinds of things. And the home stories really, though, operate on a system of justice. And, and it's really or, or do they or is it is like he doesn't go and hunt them down and shoot them. Is that the only difference? <laughs> well, he's a general. It is, and it's a big difference. I guess it, I guess it is a big difference, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, Holmes is, and this again, this is one of my favorite themes of the stories, right? Holmes is an agent of empire. Yeah. Um, we love him, but his job is to restore to order what has been set into disarray. And sometimes that's for the best. You know, sometimes that means bringing the KKK to justice. Um, but sometimes it's not telling a girl who's being lied to by her stepfather that she's being lied to by her stepfather um, because that yeah. upsets the family dynamic. Um, so there is this sense of Holmes is very much guided by a sense of justice and a moral compass, but it is, but it is his own, different. it is his own, his own personal idea is, what this oh, is though, right? He is Batman. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think, you know, one of the things I'm learning in these stories is that Watson seems to have this, you know, very, Watson seems to have more of the kind of middle class traditional idea of morality yes. and what's supposed to happen. And Holmes is very much more individualistic about that, that he has yes. a he has a personal code um, that that it's not that sometimes isn't in tune with society. And for this story, it is certainly like people would want to see the murder, the murder of you know Oppenshaw and his family brought Absolutely. to justice. Um, but even so, we, we, there are stories coming that we'll see Holmes do things that are not strictly legal, but are in keeping with his moral code. And what happens when these forces are opposing? What happens when you have to break the law to uphold your own morality? Well, his idea of, of he says, young Oppenshaw shall not remain long unavenged. And Holmes is going to send, he, he, he himself gets five pips out of, a, out of an orange. He rips the orange open. I love that. Yes tearing it to pieces and then he's going to send a very nasty letter to these <laughs> strongly <laughs> worded note you are naughty boys this is a strongly worded note you are very naughty <laughs> he also sends a telegram to yeah. the you know to the uh to the um that to the place where that where it's going to arrive that they will well, we're modern men we can't yes. rely on yes. sundials and envelopes we we'd use the technology available to us right he has discovered that you know it is he has discovered the ship because of the ports that it has gone into and it's american in origin and it's captain the, james calhoun that's you know subtle yes. captain of the bark lone star for our lone star martini lone star martini i love this exchange too where he's like I think it's one of the states of the union. And Watson's like, oh yeah, I think it's Texas. And Holmes is like, I was not and am not sure which. Watson knows this. Something Watson this. knows that Holmes doesn't know. The I nickname of Texas. Watson's like, Texas, Lone Star, Texas. And Holmes is like, just like I, I, I literally don't know. It's in my lumber room somewhere. I can't I know. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> And um, Holmes... Uh, Holmes knows that they're going to get the letter and, and it'll give them a sleepless night, but then the, you know, then they'll be, they'll be taken by the authorities at the port in Savannah, Georgia. But the story ends, and this is the most curious part about this story. It ends with this kind of it, deus ex machina justice, yeah. right? Like they yeah. find out that 
instead of the uh the 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 by the time well i'll read the ending by the time of their sailing ship by the time their sailing ship reaches savannah the mail boat will have carried this letter and the cable will have informed the police of savannah that these three gentlemen are badly wanted here upon a charge of murder <clears throat> there is ever a flaw however in the best laid of human plans this is watson and the murderers of john openshaw were never to receive the orange pips, which would show them that another, as cunning and resolute as themselves, was upon their track. Very long and severe were the equinoctial gales of that year. There they are. <clears throat> we waited long for news of the Lone Star of Savannah, but none ever reached us. We did at last hear that somewhere far out in the Atlantic, a shattered stern post of a boat was seen swinging in the trough of a wave with the letters L.S. carved upon it, and that is all which we shall ever know of the fate of the Lone Star. So Clark Clark Russell couldn't have written it better. Um, that, And that's why, as he says in the beginning, right, that right? this is one of those cases that Which is... Which is so remarkable in its details and so startling in its results yeah. that I'm tempted to get some of it. Yeah. Go in ahead. spite of the fact that there are certain po there are points in connection with it which ha which never have been and probably never will be entirely cleared up it's gorgeously framed yeah partially cleared up and have their explanations founded rather upon conjecture and surmise than on the absolute logical proof that holmes believes it's these guys and you know well there's no more open shawls so <laughs> <laughs> There's no way to say that problem that solved. We no other open shawl got solved. a letter. Yeah. Um, yeah. A, a, a very unusual ending to a story. And but this is what Watson has set us up for in the beginning that I'm right. going to give you a case that might not have this satisfying, you know, I got the bad guy and here he is. Mm -hmm. um, um, but uh but justice happened, sir. And the fact that he brought that phrase back equinoctial gales yeah as he set up in the beginning of the story right this kind of unnatural world comes to our you know civilization the handmade world of london yeah. and here it is that unnatural world that natural world is you know taking it's is is is, is correcting the yes the problems that have happened in the civilized world. Yes, I mean, incredible. that's a very it's incredible. And that's a, and that's a very comforting, you know, like that's Providence. And we've had, yeah. we've had Providence mentioned in, especially in study in Scarlet. Yes. Um, this is, you know, this is an act, this is an act of Providence that there is, there must be some kind of, you know, order to the universe that these men would be destroyed for this. Um, yeah, Instead. nature oh, yeah. blows up Op and Shaw across their path, and nature will heal what the minds of man have corrupted. Yep, it's incredible. It's it's a gorgeously framed story. I think it's a story we don't think about enough. It's a story yeah. we don't talk about enough. It, it rarely makes anybody's uh, top lists of Sherlock Holmes stories because again, Doyle said he loved it. It's one of Doyle's top stories. It's a great story. Yeah. Um, it's not a really great mystery, but it is a great adventure, um, and it's a beautifully written. Um, it's beautifully written. It's beautifully framed, um, and the descriptions of nature that we get, I think, are phenomenal. Yeah. I'll stand up for Doyle's writing. Well, that's it. So Sherlockians, thank you for joining us for episode nine of Sherlock Mondays. Mary, oh man, I love having you back. Um, so great to be on. You'll be back for episode 13 for the adventure of the noble bachelor. Very exciting. That will be fun. Coming up next week, everyone, on the next episode, Anastasia Klimchinskaya returns again for The Man with the Twisted Lip, um, which is definitely one of my favorite Sherlock stories. So, and I'll have to tell people how I, how I used to use Hugh Boone as a uh, pseudonym for myself, actually, in certain things. So, um, but uh, thank you to Ray Betzner. 
Uh, thank you so much, Ray, for talking about the uh, BSI and Vincent Starrett, and uh, wonderful to have you here. Um, thanks to our chat, Mrs. Hudson, Brianna, for managing, managing the live chat links. Uh, thank you to the sponsor of Sherlock Monday's Lisa Washington. We couldn't do these shows without the generous support of our patrons. You can support the Rosenbach through donation. Your support helps us create more programs like this and also care for our collections. Uh, you can also become a member of the Rosenbach. Of the Rosenbach is, is the Lone Star Martini. I'll have to blame for that. It's a good, it's a good martini. Ro <laughs> Rosenbach. Um, <laughs> You're becoming Sean Connery. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you can also become a member. Membership gives you early access and discounts to programs and courses. You can find more at our website, Rosenbach.org. Again, let me remind you to subscribe to this channel and to like these videos and leave comments. And if you're listening to the podcast, leave us a review. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, everyone. Every everyone, I am Edward G. Pettit of the Rosenbach Museum and Library, where the game is a book. Bye-bye.